learning uh, again. Uh, that was an excellent talk, uh, not only scientifically, but also in characterizing the excellent science that is done within the networks of the AI. Uh, as I said yesterday, the AI is now 25 years old and is maintaining networks over the entire continent. And we are learning in the process of making this kind of sound, solid science applicable to the decision-making process, the tools of the trade of uh, the dialogue of between science and policy. So in these networks, we now routinely conduct multi-level stakeholder consultations to strengthen the climate resilience of the region in a socio-environmental context. I'm just kidding. Uh, nobody knows how to fill that mouthful of words with meaning and actually conduct science in a reasonable way. Uh, but it is a language that we can hear in many quarters uh, that I read in proposals that we receive and that I hear reported and repeated in high-level fora and institutions. So our approach has been a little different, uh, particularly with the help of Marcella. We bring in young scientists who hopefully have not been contaminated by the virus of that language and we lock them up for a week at a time and have them thresh out uh, new approaches to the science policy interface. And one of the experiences of that I had yesterday when I was told scientists cannot communicate, their life depends on it, and politicians haven't got a clue how to direct science to be useful. That's the other extreme. Uh, the polished language is missing, the gut feeling comes out, out of this group, uh, and uh, the, the task of not only the training seminars, the uh, professional advancement, and the reformulation of a new science is to find a middle way uh, between uh, the big words that we cannot fill with meaning and fill even less with real actions of scientific investigations in the field. And in a way, uh, Arturo gave you some of the examples, I give you more. And they all come uh, from the scientists that are in the field doing research, funded by the IAI, having their, their arms twisted by me and others uh, so that their science becomes more relevant and understandable. One of them is uh, by a uh, researcher, Perillo, in Argentina, who came with the idea of using land surface waters, i.e. lakes, rivers, lagoons, uh, as indicators, as sentinels of global change. So he goes out into the field, and, and, and this is, is in dry areas very often, so really what he's measuring is the ecosystems that receive the runoff, the rain, the filtration, water, and so on from the dry forest and the dry regions. And uh, he looks at the water quality as well as the water quantity. Uh, he realized very quickly that the level of scientific sophistication and complexity that we saw in these sensor work is not something uh, that can be easily communicated to decision makers. So rather than using an index of water quality that contains oxygen levels, nutrient levels, uh, uh, conductivity, etc., and developing complex indices, he tried to develop an, an index that is basically turbidity. Anybody can look at the water and say, well, this is transparent, this is not transparent. This lake is muddy, it is not muddy. And for the different ecosystems, you can relate this to sediment load, to oxygen content, and so on and so on. 
but it gave him and the communities that he's working in a very quick and easy tool to assess uh, the water quality of these lakes. So that was a very real example in the field of trying to simplify science in a sound and solid way. And of course, you can use sechi disks, which are these disks that limnologists use to lower into the water. And when the disk becomes extinct to the eyes above the water, that is the depth of where turbidity at this point basically obliterates the view. Uh, a scientific measure, but a very applicable, very simple scientific measure. Uh, with these, he's also stumbled across things like tipping points. Tipping points are uh, allegedly those points where climate and global change goes over a threshold. We see radical ecosystem change, and there's no going back, or going back only at very substantial costs. So tipping points are part of this global discussion of complex words and complex institutions, but in the very real life of a lake in Argentina, a tipping point, for instance, was that between climate change of three or four dry years and global change influences like permanent, continuous water use for agricultural irrigation that actually increases in dry years because of course you have to put more water on your fields as you uh, enter into a dry year. Some of these lakes, or particularly one lake in, in the province of Buenos Aires, reached a very, very low level, high salinity values, and as a result, at, in, this, uh, uh, in this particular year, the population of fish that was commercially exploited from the lake disappeared. It has never come back. So this is a real tipping point, an understandable tipping point, a tipping point that you can look at, and if you put your fishing rod out there over the lake, you will see what the tipping point means. Of course, that has other uh, effects on the ecosystem, and when we consult with the people living in the local village, they will tell us, of course, that the water birds have disappeared, who lived of the fish that was in, in the water. So these are uh, very real observations linked to very sound, solid uh, scientific work. And I think we need to uh, moderate our language in order to promote the dialogue between decision makers, but not only decision makers, but also the people who benefit from ecosystem services and uh, who uh, live uh, near ecosystems that they value so that we can find a continuum of information and appropriate language that can link this highly sophisticated science that is unique in the world that Arturo uh, presented to us. And uh, he is quite, quite clearly a great fan of technology and technological innovation. So whenever a new sensor or a new technology appears on the horizon, he will latch on to it and incorporate it into the analysis of ecosystems. And we've made a tremendous progress with that. But at the same time, he uh, and, and the team in Brazil in particular have managed to use that very sophisticated science and synthesize it to present it to lawmakers and convince lawmakers uh, of an action to take. So that is in reality what we're looking for. We're not looking for great big words of state, multi-level stakeholder cons uh, uh, consultation. Of course, these stakeholder consultations are always made with key stakeholders. I've never seen a proposal from anyone where the stakeholders they consulted were not key stakeholders. I'm not quite sure how they define them, but they're all, they must be very uh, it's, it's exactly that kind of language that is, that is putting a layer of fog over the understanding of the science that we try to do. And I actually quite enjoyed, I, I have a vague feeling that all of you enjoyed all of yesterday uh, because of the critical mood in the room, but I quite enjoyed the discussions because it was a genuine attempt uh, to find a way 
uh, to find a language and to find a link between our normal everyday, our decision making and potentially the decision makers thinking and the science that we as scientists can do in order to give us a continuum of understanding and that's what we're looking for between the sophisticated science and the conclusions from that science that facilitate uh, decision making. So I, I hope with, with these very brief comments, originally the idea was to provide a synthesis uh, at the end of the week. We're now in the middle of the week and I hope that synthesis, that insight will help you to reach a more productive end of the week. Thank you. Thank you, Hong. Um, now we have uh, any questions or comments from the audience? Any more something that bring that? Well, the ideas, Mr. Hong. Thank you for your presentation, but I speak in Spanish because my English is not good, okay? Por falar até português. Bom, como temos uma audiência que ela é mais espanhola, eu vou tentar. Cris, a gente falou sobre a importância de ter uma ação mais efetiva na transmissão do conhecimento que estamos fazendo, como também é aprovechando los conocimientos de las poblaciones que son afuera de la academia, por ejemplo. Teníamos antes, ayer, a eh, Alfredo, que es un ganadero, pero que tiene muchos conocimientos en la ciencia, porque también es arquitecto. Y esto, le pregunto, ¿crees que la mejor manera, ojalá sea una de las mejores, pero la, no toda la mejor, es que para basar, basar la toma de decisión es que la mejor manera es que alcanzar la población de este país que va a estar mejor preparada, o sea, transmitir los, los conocimientos que estamos haciendo para que puedan presionar o hacer presión sobre sus gobiernos o, lo, o aquellos que de hecho Una, una pregunta bastante complicada porque eh, no tenemos una población de un país homogénea tenemos pobres y ricos tenemos gente en ciudades gente en el campo eh, la visión de la biodiversidad, el funcionamiento de un ecosistema eh, que existe en una ciudad es totalmente diferente de la visión que tiene un ganadero entonces, eh, transmitir este tipo de conocimiento a los grupos diferentes de la sociedad va a ser muy, muy difícil. Lo que es importante es realizar que algunas, eh, alguna toma de decisión no ocurra al nivel nacional o internacional, pero al nivel del municipio, por ejemplo. Lo que pasa en una laguna, en un lago eh, local, es tal vez eh, la decisión de no solo un municipio, pero de cinco. Eh, Brasil ha tomado una iniciativa de crear eh, comités de ríos, consejos de ríos, que en la ley brasileña ahora tienen eh, un poder legislativo político arriba de los municipios. Eh, la base de esto es que claramente si queremos eh, manejar una cuenca de agua tenemos que tomar las decisiones a un nivel arriba de los municipios. Eh, estas iniciativas puntuales eh, son muy, muy importantes para eh, lograr una coincidencia de escalas de conocimiento con escalas de toma de decisión. Y creo que esto es lo más importante, que uh, si, si queremos uh, gente uh, interesados en um, la mejora de su ambiente, es mucho más fácil que uh, enganchar a esta gente para mejorar algo que es mucho más difícil a entender. Ayer tuvimos el ejemplo de la recuperación de los laguitos o de los wetlands de Canadá. Eh, mi respuesta cuando vi que están haciendo era eh, si yo fuera el dueño de este campo 
no dejaré a esta gente entrar en mi campo para restaurar el wetland. Simplemente porque no hacen en este plan, no, no hacen por limitaciones políticas restauración, simplemente dejan el agua en el campo. Si se hace restauración con pastizales adecuados, con las plantas que normalmente se ve en el ecosistema natural, con los sauces que crecen al lado del, del agua, etc., y así estableciendo un ecosistema que funciona, tal vez con el pez, tal vez con eh, eh, algo más que solamente mosquitos, con mucho gusto lo hago. Es, son, son estas discusiones, este conocimiento muy localizado, junto con la ciencia, que nos lleva adelante. Claro que hay otras consideraciones que son globales, la emisión de CO2, el efecto del de cambio climático global, que es más grande en la zona andina, andina, que tiene más impacto en la zona andina que en otros lugares, el cambio climático que uh, nos lleva a eventos extremos como hoy en la costa de Chile, uh, o como uh, muchas veces en el cono sur durante el, uh, el último año, estas son decisiones de una discusión global. Pero, la escala de toma de decisión, la escala de discusión, la escala de la ciencia tiene que coincidir.